Hello everyone. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to all those who are listening in today. This is a series of three short talks on the Apostle St. Thomas and the Syrian Christians of Kerala. The first part today is on the Blessed City of Edessa and the Syrian Christians. In this I will take you through a brief historical account of how St. Thomas was involved <clears throat> in the conversion to Christianity of both Edessa and the Syrian Christians as they believe and articulate it. In the second and third parts, I will examine the challenges raised by scholars on the apostolic origins of the Syrian Christians, and I will do this on the basis of a wider set of sources and related scholarship. The classical name of the city of Edessa is Uruho, and it is situated on the river Daisan in the upper reaches of the Mesopotamian region, and it was the capital of a small country called Osrehoni. After the time of Alexander the Great, his successor Seleucus Nicator is thought to have renamed the city as Edessa in memory of uh, a city by the same name in Macedonia. So at the time of Jesus, the city was called Edessa. Edessa's fame in Christian literature is that it was the capital of this kingdom that converted to Christianity at a very early stage, in fact between 33 and 35 AD. According to tradition, it was St. Thomas who sent an evangelist called Tadeus or Mar Adai in Syriac and this was in fulfillment of a promise Jesus had made. Now according to the Syrian Christians tradition it was the same Apostle Thomas who arrived in their country in 52 AD and converted their ancestors to Christianity. This is only one of the reasons that the Syrian Christians of Kerala and Edessa are linked. Now, one of the earliest sources containing information about the origins of Christianity both in Edessa and in India is that of Eusebius of Caesarea. Eusebius's ecclesiastical history, written in the Greek language between 324 and 25 AD, is a comprehensive account of the first 300 years of Christianity. And in it is stated how the Edessans became Christians and Eusebius stated that he had uh, gathered his information from a book called the Chronicles of Edessa. Eusebius also mentioned that St. Thomas was the apostle who had evangelized the Indians and that the apostle was martyred and buried in a place called Kalamina. Now in the 17th and 18th centuries, Western scholars received this information with great skepticism. This was the age of reason and the age of rationalism. Nothing was to be taken at face value. Everything was questioned and everything needed evidence. So uh, scientific inquiry was the only way of knowing anything, including the Bible and the history of Christianity, after much analysis and examination. New theories were being proposed, such as that the Bible was not a literal but an allegorical book. Another theory was that the books in the Old Testament were written at a much later stage than the events themselves. Now this was problematic. This led to a revolution in Christian historical thinking. Till then the oldest books available were in Hebrew and Greek and Latin and there was a concerted effort to find other books in other languages if they were to be had of a, a, a greater antiquity and great many books were found and they were brought to European centers of learning and there was as a result 
an exponential growth in scholarship in these languages and um, what the ancient manuscripts said. There was a, a an ex, uh, there was great scholarship in Coptic and Syriac and Amharic of Ethiopia, and it resulted in bringing to light many old books and documents in these languages. But it also intensified the debate on the scriptures as well as church history. So one of the frequently asked questions regarding Edessa and the Syrian Christians was, where did Eusebius get his information from? And how trustworthy was Eusebius's account? Now, in the middle of the 19th century, there was a very interesting development. William Curtin was the curator of the British Museum, and he discovered hundreds of Syriac manuscripts. And he began cataloguing them and choosing some of the most ancient ones and translating them into English and publishing them. To his amazement, which he declared in one of his prefaces, these were very ancient texts indeed, belonging to between 65 and 80 AD. Curitan declared that these were indeed Eusebius's sources and that these were authentic. So, unfortunately, Curitan died suddenly in 1864, but his work was carried on by another scholar called William Wright. Now, what do these sources tell us about the conversion of Edessa? According to the Chronicles of Edessa, during the time of Jesus, there was in Osrehone uh, a ruler called Abgar. Now, Abgar is only a title, so this particular Abgar was Abgar V. He was a great king, and he was a friend of the Roman Emperor Tiberius at the time. But sadly, Abgar was suffering from an incurable disease. And he heard of a great physician called Jesus in the land of Palestine, and that he was working mighty miracles. So Abgar wrote a letter to Jesus, asking him, requesting him to come to Edessa and heal him, and offered him a place of refuge from his enemies. He sent the letter through his trusted envoy called Hanan. Jesus heard this letter read to him and he dictated a reply. He could not come now, but since he, uh, since Abgar had believed in him even without having seen him, his city will be called blessed and that its enemies shall never prevail against it. Jesus also promised to send one of his disciples to heal him of his affliction. Now, Abga had asked Hanan also to bring back an image of Jesus so he could see what Jesus looked like. According to tradition, according to uh, the Chronicles of Edessa, as Hanan was drawing Jesus, Jesus picked up a piece of cloth and pressed it against his face, and miraculously his image was imprinted on it. And Hanan returned to Edessa with this image and Jesus' reply. Uh, Abgar received this letter and waited, and not long afterwards Jesus was crucified. After Jesus' ascension, St. Thomas sent Thaddeus to Oroho, or Edessa. Now, St. Thomas was, St. Thomas had a twin, and it was this twin, and his name was Thaddeus, that St. Thomas had sent to Edessa. Thomas's own name was Judah, because Thomas only means twin. So, uh, Mar Adai or Mar uh, Saint Thaddeus preached the gospel of Christ to King Agbar, uh, Ag Abgar, and he was healed of his illness, and the king and his whole kingdom adopted Christianity. 
Now, just as the story of the conversion of King Abgar was very important to the Christians of Edessa, the story of St. Thomas coming to Kerala and converting the Syrian Christians' ancestors is fundamental to their Christian identity and traditional belief. The narrative of the Syrian Christians is a very simple one. According to this, St. Thomas the Apostle landed in a place called Kodungalur in Kerala in 52 AD. He travelled up and down the region converting small pockets of people to Christianity and he established churches in seven, dif seven and a half different places and he erected crosses in more, uh, uh, yet another set of places. Now the churches were established in um, Kodingalur, Palayur, Paravur, Gokamangalam, Niranam, Chayal and Kollam. And the eight, an eighth place called Tiruvidam Kod is also included, but for some obscure reason it is um, accorded only a half church status. They also believed that he erected crosses in a series of places and that he, travelling to the, the east coast, he was martyred in a place called Mailapo and that his holy relics were removed to Edessa at a subsequent stage. Now these particular milestones of the narrative and the, the basic belief that St. Thomas the Apostle was their uh, evangelist is an integral part and fundamental to the Syrian Christians' uh, religion and identity. However, the, the Dutch and British Protestant historians who arrived in Kerala and um, heard the story in the 18th and 19th centuries were very skeptical about it. Uh, they wanted evidence and evidence for historians is in the form of um, stone inscriptions or archaeological evidence or uh, monuments and unfortunately they found none of these. So they also searched extensively for literary evidence such as chronicles, royal edicts, letters etc. And these two uh, they found none in Kerala or the Syrian Christians could not produce any of this, at least not any that were reliable and consistent and um, corroborating of each other. So consequently what has happened is over the past 300 years successive historians, uh, in fact very famous and the majority of historians of Christianity have recounted this narrative and exa uh, their examination of it very minutely often and come to the conclusion, consistent conclusion, that the, the belief of the Syrian Christians is improbable, inaccurate and unhistorical. In fact, they state that it is a false story. They also provide reasons for this and this is that um, there are many discrepancies in their narrative. First of all, regarding the, the martyrdom of St. Thomas, where St. Eusebius says it is Kalamina, they maintain it was Mylapo, and a theologian called, called Pantaneus of Alexandria in the third century tra travelled to, no sorry, Pantaneus lived in the second century in 192 AD, travelled to a place called India and he discovered Christians there and they maintained that they were converted by Saint Bartholomew and he discovered they possessed a Hebrew Bible written by Saint Matthew. So returning to Alexandria he wrote about all this, which historians point out is clear evidence that India was not converted by St. Thomas. Another reason is the Christians of India, including Brahmins in their early converts, 
Scholars point out that Brahmins did not exist in Kerala in the first century. The establishing of seven and a half churches is discredited because it is not an exact number. The stories were all identical, scholars pointed out, in the seven different places, pointing out that this is most likely to have happened because uh, the Syrian Christians were taking the stories from one manuscript source. So they all had only one story. And most importantly, their claim that St. Thomas established the veneration of the cross as an emblem of Christ and that he erected crosses. They pointed out that the cross itself in the first 300 years of Christianity was an object of ridicule and shame and that it was venerated only after Emperor Constantine's mother Helena discovered it in Jerusalem in the 4th century. So all these reasons put together was the foundation upon which the Western historians have formulated their conclusions. They also did not fail to provide their own alternative theories as to how Christianity arrived in India and when. Uh, they say it was probably the Alexandrian theologian Pantaneus himself, but most scholars believe Christianity arrived in India only in the 4th or 5th centuries and this could have been through the agency of visiting bishops or merchants or uh, travellers from Syria, Mesopotamia, Alexandria etc. or even refugees fleeing from their persecution in Persia. Uh, most importantly they point out in the 3rd century Someone called Badesanes wrote a book called The Acts of Thomas. Badesanes is, is, is uh, in Syriac language Badaisan. Now Badaisan, it was already acknowledged by early church fathers, was a Gnostic and hence a heretic. So his writings were already discredited in the Christian world. However, European historians, Western historians primarily, have um, pointed out that since the stories of Badai's son regarding St. Thomas and the Syrian Christians' stories are almost identical, the Syrian Christians most likely borrowed the stories from Badai's son and transplanted it to Malabar, ancient Malabar. Now why would they do this? It is an astonishing reason that they give it, that it was to enhance their status by falsely claiming an apostolic pedigree. Again the question remains why would anybody do this? And the reason given is that it was far more attractive to have an apostle as the founding father rather than a later figure. These are significant and serious assessments of the origin and agency of Christianity in India and I will examine it more closely in the next two talks. Returning to the subject of the blessed city of Edessa and its connection with the Syrian Christians, there is one more factor and this is uh, about St. Thomas's relics. It is believed that St. Thomas's relics were removed to Edessa in the 4th century AD. How do we know this? This is through the writing of writings of um, St. Ephraim. St. Ephraim was a 4th century theologian of the Syriac Church and he was also one of its leading hymnodists, writing hundreds if not thousands of hymns. And in one set of hymns St. Ephraim talks of St. Thomas in India and he talks of the, the removal of the relics to Edessa and the building of a magnificent cathedral in Edessa to house the relics. Now St. Ephraim died in 373 AD so we can um, safely conclude that 
the translation of the relics took place before 373 AD. I would like to conclude with a brief mention of what happened to the letter and the image of Jesus received by King Abgar V of Edessa. According to the Edessan tradition, the image was ensconced above the city gate because the citizens and the king believed Jesus' words of blessing the city and that the image would protect it from its enemies. We have further evidence in the writings of a later pilgrim, a lady called Egeria or Etheria, who travelled to Palestine and to Edessa itself in the 4th century AD. And according to her, she went to Edessa and the Bishop of Edessa himself took her to see the letter and the image above the city gate. Her letters are in print and it is available to us to read. Sadly, the successors of King Abgar V abandoned Christianity and reverted to their pagan faith. So we do not know exactly what happened to this holy image of Jesus and the holy letter. However, copies of both are extant and the copies of the image is called the Holy Mandelian of Edessa. Um, the letter itself is considered a charm for protection against all kinds of danger. So copies of it have been used extensively in the Mesopotamian region and as far as Europe. In fact, there is a tradition, according to some historians, that it was used in England also, where people used to hang it in their homes as a charm to protect them. Uh, there is a medieval English poem in, of the 11th century narrating the Abgar story and the legend. To conclude, I would like to also touch upon the topic of the Syriac manuscripts in London. From the 19th century onwards, scores of Western Syriac scholars have produced uh, translations and critical editions of um, very ancient Syriac manuscripts and they mention that they discovered or found these manuscripts in the British Museum or the British Library. The very interesting question is how these Syriac manuscripts in their hundreds came to be in the British Museum and the British Library. I hope to discuss this subject at a later talk. Thank you very much for listening.